Okay, systematic sample um, is, we're getting better, probably less likely to be biased, but the idea here is that you basically pick every case person. So for example, if I want to do a systematic sample of Sacred Heart students, go through the roster, pick every 15th person, or every 5th person, every 50th person. Okay. Um, if I want to do a simple random, sorry, if I want to do a systematic sample of people uh, going to a certain Starbucks, stand outside Starbucks, every 20th person, say, hey, you're, are you, you can be part of my sample, things like that. Imagine, the kind of best example is imagine like there's some assembly line, like, you know, the, imagine the GM factory that's kind of, there's an assembly line, you know, putting out uh, Ford Tauruses. To do a systematic sample, you'd pick every 100th uh, you know, Ford Taurus, and then you'd kind of maybe do some quality control on that. This is actually pretty good. Every once in a while, though, there's an issue with a systematic sample where your the nature of the flow of it actually individuals are related. So, for example, you might think about, um, you know, do a systematic sample of people at a football game. Well, it turns out maybe like every 50th person through the gate was like a security guard coming back from their break or something like that. You can imagine if you did a systematic sample of like, you know, donuts going down an assembly line, well, maybe there's some defect on the donut wheel that actually makes every 50th donut especially crispy or especially burnt or something like that. So usually this is pretty good. There are some rare cases where I actually have to be a little careful. Finally, now we've reached the gold standard of, of uh, sampling designs, which is something called a simple random sample. And simple random sample, we give the abbreviation SRS, and it's going to be the, by far the most important uh, sample, the one that's least likely to be biased, the one that's going to be used over and over again in uh, a lot of things later in future chapters. And essentially, this is what you would kind of be waiting for. Just pick all the names out of a hat. Do a simple random sample of Sacred Heart students, throw all the names in a hat, pick out ten names, that's a simple random sample. Okay? Do a simple random sample of, uh, you know, people in San Francisco, need a pretty big hat here, but throw all the names of uh, San Franciscans in a hat, draw out a hundred names, that's your simple random sample. The definition of a simple random sample I've written in this box. It's every possible group of size n, that's your sample size, is equally likely to be chosen. Okay, That's a different thing than actually describing how you do it. This is actually the definition of what it means. And kind of think, let's think this through a little bit because it's a little bit tricky. Think about for Sacred Heart students, there are many different possible groups of 10 Sacred Heart students. In fact, there's millions, if not billions, if not trillions, of possible ways you could pick 10 Sacred Heart students. One possible group is the first 10 names in the uh, roster. Another 10 names might be the 10 girls on the JV volleyball team. Right? Another 10 names might be you know, the 10 people in the Latin II honors class. There's a, trillions of um, groups of 10 people. If you were just picking names out of a hat... I think you'd agree that every possible group of 10 students is equally likely to be chosen. That's the definition of a simple random sample. Now, in practice, of course, you really don't use a hat, right? You do something else different that we'll talk about where you assign every single person a number and then randomly pick numbers. And we'll talk about that in class. It's a little bit tough for me to show in this, in this uh, video. But simple random sample super duper duper important because actually a lot of the math we're going to do later on relies on the fact that it's a simple random sample. And this is really the best one we'll talk about in this class because it's the least likely to be biased. Speaking of bias, let's talk about bias. Okay, Bias is when I've been saying sampling designs are good or bad, what I really mean is they are not biased or they are biased. And so what does this term bias mean? Bias means when your sampling design systematically favors certain outcomes. In other words, Something you're doing in the way you're picking your sample causes the data not to be representative as a whole, right? For example, think about convenience sampling, right? If you just ask the people around you, well, it turns out that actually they're going to be like you and your results of your sample might not represent your population, okay? Um, if you do, uh, you know, a, a voluntary response sample, it turns out that is often biased because certain people... Uh, who have strong opinions are overstated in the sample. There's lots of different ways a sample can be biased, but bias in general means you're doing something that systematically favors certain outcomes. Okay?
And I'd like to give you a few vocabulary words that are basically types of bias. These are certainly not the only types of bias, and we can actually see how bias will come up in lots of different ways, and sometimes it just takes a sentence to explain it's biased because. But here's some vocabulary words that might help you kind of think about ways in which uh, a sampling design can be biased. These are all some just additional vocabulary words. The first kind of bias is something called non-response. This is something that actually you see periodically, which is that actually in part of your sample, individuals just don't respond. Individuals don't respond. This happens all the time. I'm sure you've had the experience where the phone rings, you know, you're having dinner, someone says, hey, we're doing a survey, would you like to be part of our survey, and what happens? You hang up the phone on them, right? And you might actually think, well, who tends to hang up the phone? People who are busy, and therefore they are underrepresented in the sample, where who actually might talk to the people who are calling during dinner time? I don't know. I mean, maybe lonely people, right? Or maybe, you know, people who are single, who need somebody to talk to, or maybe people who are unemployed. I mean, you can imagine different kind of scenarios, but non-response is the idea that certain individuals just choose not to be part of the sample. Or it happens all the time, you know, Sacred Heart's doing a survey right now where they're asking parents in questions. Not every parent even fills out the form, right? And so that's an example of non-response. The next type of bias is something called undercoverage, and that means you are systematically missing people um, in the sample. For example, when the United States government kind of is doing a, a census, there are certain people that are just really hard to reach. Homeless people, right? People, criminals who actually, when someone says, hey, would you like to tell us about your, when the government sends you something saying, tell us about yourself, they're a little skeptical and they don't reply. Under coverage is the idea that you are systematically missing certain people, right? For example, convenience sampling certainly suffers from under coverage bias, where if you're asking people, asking just your friends, you're missing certain people who might not be your friends. And you can imagine why, of course, this is a problem, right? And so this is why, in general, we do a simple random sample if we can, because we're guaranteed to represent every single person. Okay? Um, but under coverage is a real problem when you're doing huge, large samples, because how do you possibly reach, you know, if you're going to call people, for example, and ask them their opinion on something, what about people without phones, right? What about people with only cell phones who aren't in the phone book? What about people with unlisted phone numbers, right? It's really actually, under coverage is a real problem in practice. Two more kinds of bias, and this one is called something called response bias, which is basically the idea that people give the wrong response. All right, people lie, but really what it means is they give the wrong response. And this can actually be intentionally or not intentionally, intentionally or not. Um, this is a real problem, for example, when you talk about, you know, surveys on sensitive subjects, right? If I ask Taker Heart students, you know, have you done drugs? You might be not likely to give the right answer, right? You know, if you have. Um, big problem, you know, all sorts of sensitive questions about things like, you know, personal issues. Um, uh, people tend to actually lie to the responder, right? Um, you know, have you ever committed a crime? People might tend to not give the right answer. That's all an example of intentional response bias, but actually there's this more subtle kind of um, non-intentional uh, response bias. For example, if I said, how many movies have you seen in the last year? You might not know, so you might just kind of estimate and give the wrong answer. If I say, how many pairs of shoes have you, do you own? You might not know, so you might give the, you know, the wrong answer. Um, this is actually a real problem with, like the, with Netflix, as a little aside. You know, Netflix has this issue of like, what movie do you think you want to watch? Well, it turns out actually people actually like movies that they think they, they they say they want they they say their favorite movies are like you know the ones that win best picture, but actually they're kind of like you know silly little comedies is actually what actually happens. Um, so it, sometimes people don't even kind of know for themselves you know what is the right answer. What would you do in this situation? Is a classic issue of response bias. People say they would do things differently than they actually would. Okay. And the last kind of bias we're going to talk about is something called a poorly worded question, which is exactly what you think it is. It's a question that is worded so poorly um, that it elicits certain responses from um, a sample. For example, if I said, you know, America was founded on liberty, and given the fact that actually our Constitution pr uh, protects gun ownership, do you think there should be limiting rights on gun ownership? Yeah. That's an example of a question that's clearly leading towards one political view, right? Similarly, if I said, you know, 
given the fact that our government wastes a bunch of money, how would you feel about raising taxes, right? Is a very, would get a very different response than the government has many programs that help uh, people who need help. How would you feel about raising taxes to support these vital programs, okay? Things like that, just changing the wording of a question can dramatically swing things one way or the other, okay? And all those things are kinds of bias.